welcome to Humber's second annual Entrepreneurship Challenge. My name is Daniel Schwartz and I'll be the beaming host for the show. We're located here at Humber College North Campus where you will see with your own eyes the $40,000 grand prize winner of Launchpad. Nine teams will battle it out, partner or no partner, pitching their idea to our panel of five professional judges. Emotions run high, folks. These teams have spent hours and hours brainstorming their ideas, finalizing them, and working with their coaches to come up with the master plan. It is their time to launch their ideas. But whose idea will keep on soaring? Let's meet our judges. I'm Farhan Bolka. I work in commercialization of technologies, uh, working with research institutes and corporations to take early technologies all the way to market. I'm Daryl Aiken. I'm an entrepreneur. Right now, I'm the owner-operator of a company called FabricSpark.com. Hi, my name is Rudy Blair. I'm the music and entertainment reporter for 680 News, City TV, and Rogers Television. I'm Sean Stanley. I'm a journalist and product manager at the Global Mail. I work on automotive and small business. Hi, I'm Peter Lambert. I'm an associate director for Scotia McLeod, and I've been in the investment field for the last 33 years, helping individuals realize their retirement goals. What are you expecting from this year's finalists of Launchpad? We're looking for innovation. Uh, I think we're looking for a lot of enthusiasm and passion for their ideas. And we're looking for viability. You know, is this a business idea that has legs? Is it going to uh, thrive in the real world? Is it going to be um, something that's sustainable or scalable? Also be ready to take criticism because you may think you've got a great idea, but you may find out that maybe it's not going to work and you may have to take advice from somebody else and say, hey, try something different. Don't take it personally, even though it is your personal idea. Just be willing to learn that if you're willing to make those changes, what you want may actually happen. So basically what I recommend to every entrepreneur is go out and explore what the customer really needs. Uh, I see a lot of people spending a lot of time on their product, on their basic, uh, basic thoughts, not asking the question to customers what they really need or not really making the effort to understand what the customers really need. And in the end, we have these products, services, concepts that come together and don't really connect with the customer needs really. Uh, it's a tough job to go out and put yourself forward and ask those questions and observe and understand and sometimes question all that great ideas that you had and modify them. But unless you do it, uh, it's going to be difficult to uh, fix it afterwards. Hi, my name is Wes. I graduated from the Industrial Design Program at Humber College. Hi, my name is Mike. I graduated from Brock University in the Program of Sport Management. Uh, me and Wes are the team Tuscarora. Uh, we combined our skills to create a hemp composite lacrosse stick um, to be innovators within the lacrosse industry and provide something new to the consumers. Being in the lacrosse industry, the sticks are very expensive. Um, they're usually made of carbon graphite or metal. Uh, nobody's using hemp, and we know hemp is sustainable. Uh, product that can be used in so many different applications and we thought, I thought I need to find somebody who can do something about hemp, so I met Wes. Yeah. Wes works with hemp, he's the uh, manufacturing side and I'm the sales, marketing, lacrosse side of things. Yeah, so. Essentially, yeah, so Mike approached yeah. me and uh, I had, I've had experience, uh, previous knowledge with uh, using hemp in, uh, in the composite situation, so, so yeah, we teamed up and yeah. now we're here. I, I run a summer camp and I like coaching kids and teaching kids about self-esteem, about pushing themselves, persevering. I, li I like inspiring kids. I think that's fun. But I also like I play music too. With lots, of, lots of buddies, lots of musical friends, and that's. But it's all the same. Everything in life's the same. So about working hard, doing what you love. So sports, whatever, music, it's all the same. Hi, my name is Wesley Campbell. I graduated from the Industrial Design Program at Humber College. Hi, my name is Mike Reynolds. I graduated from Brock University in Sport Management. I'm also the owner of a, a lacrosse brand called Ilax. As well, I run a summer camp that's a nonprofit teaching kids introductory lacrosse. We're here today to present to you our, lacrosse, our hemp lacrosse stick. We've combined eco friendly materials such as hemp and flax to create a composite stick that's comparable to the current composite shafts around the market today. And what's unique about our shaft being comparable to the carbon graphite composites of the, of the day is that we have a lower price point so as to remove the barrier to entry to people looking to get into sports. 
History and culture are also very important to us. Tuscarora literally means hemp gatherers and refers to an Aboriginal tribe that are part of the Six Nations. If you didn't already know, lacrosse is an Aboriginal game that was adopted by European settlers. Uh, we think it's very important as being a lacrosse person that people know these cultural heritage of the sport moving forward. So yeah, so we're here yeah. today to look for funding to help us improve our manufacturing pro uh, process and to uh, be uh, begin to get a marketable product that we can then sell to the consumer. Have you touched market with the pro? I have multiple connections within the lacrosse I industry. Think, have you touched market with the we, uh, we have, we have, we're, no, we're not we're quite at that stage. Why we're here yet. today to get, is to get money to make the next prototype. This, me and Wes did obviously in our basement because Wes works with composites. Yeah. Um, what we need the money for is to get a better prototype because then I can take it right to pros. I have many friends yeah. who are he professional lacrosse players. I, I worked in professional lacrosse and major league lacrosse as a game day event logistics operational kind of uh, role. So, actually, I want to jump in what he said because why not just go to say um, uh, Toronto Rock mm -hmm. during one of their practices or whatever and say, sure. hey, try out the stick. No, it's, it's, it's my, it's I have exactly friends that are rock players and, yeah. and that's the plan. Yeah, also. so we're not quite at that stage just yet. We're, what we're looking for funding is to get a couple of pieces of key equipment that are going to help us improve the stick quality and be able to get that stick so we're confident that we'll, when we go do go to that point, we'll have a, a functional part, uh, thing. I would feel really bad giving it to somebody if it wasn't good, if I wouldn't use it because yeah. I play high level national lacrosse and stuff. And we, we believe we can get that product. We just, we, we need the money to make a better prototype and yeah. requires certain specific uh, manufacturing process that he's much more well <laughs> versed in being the manufacturing side. I'm the sales and marketing lacrosse so side. What's wrong with that one you're holding now? Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it just can be improved. Um, the way we compressed, uh, uh, molded this was using a technique that isn't, uh, doesn't give it the right compression. Right, the next, there's a next level of compression that you need from using a specific type of machine called a vacuum pump, mm -hmm. and you, you just can call it vacuum bagging, and that so that requires us a little bit more funding to get. It's not a gross amount. The vacuum bag that we're looking to produce is only for $250, and then the bags as well and stuff like that, and um, that gives it just the right kind of compression that uh, gives it that uh, squeezes out all the excess resin and makes it lightweight. Gives it more stronger. tensile strength to yeah. weight ratio. Okay. Yeah, there's no so doubt that this is, is strong. Is anyone else doing this? No. no, no, no. They're making carbon composites. Some people are selling wood shafts because people like it because it's kind of a cool thing. Low cross industry is a niche sport, you guys might know. So this is kind of a niche product in a niche sport. So that's why I want to ask is, because yeah. who are you targeting this to? Is it just to the public? Is it to the professionals? Because yeah. if you showed yep. me a hockey stick, I'd yep. be going, okay, I get it. Yep. You show me a baseball a bat, same thing. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, don't well, get me wrong. I love yep. lacrosse, but it's not in the popularity, mm -hmm. and that's realistic. Not the popularity is hockey or football or mm -hmm. baseball. It, it is growing though. It's yeah. growing. Yeah, it's uh, one of the fastest growing sports in North America. Your question ab about lacrosse not being not necessarily probably maybe just a lack of knowledge on your part. I don't know, but um, for us, because I run a summer camp and I'm introducing kids to the sport, I also coach elite level players. We travel to tournaments. Um, it's a huge like underground sport, and people love cool, unique things. And just because it's my wheelhouse, I coach it. I love it, I run my own summer camp, I run a store in an arena, so I have brand, I can create brand awareness, so it's easy to get the stick in front of the consumer. It's just a grassroots kind of model we're working on, but yeah, you could probably take it into other things. Hockey's yeah. a lot more difficult because you, in lacrosse, yeah. the head pops on the shaft, mm. so it's, they're yeah, separate. It's a much easier uh, And customization is everything to, to kids these days, they want this head yeah. with this shaft. And, and we've talked about, yeah, the hockey stick, but yeah. again, like, it just takes, it takes a lot more research and development to be able to create, because the way uh, hockey sticks works in terms of composites, they're all one piece. And to create a one-piece uh, comps, it, it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of tr there's a lot of trade secret behind trading those kinds of products. But it's just something we've definitely talked about and yeah. something that's in the future. And all the materials are readily available. Yep, yep. <laughs> all, right. all right. Well, thank you very much for being Thank you. Yep. Thanks, guys. My name is Julia, and I'm the founder of Runway Crush. Runway Crush is a new platform that enables independent fashion designers to showcase and sell their designs. I am super excited to, to um, pitch to the judges. I'm a little nervous as well, but um, I think it's going to be an excellent, um, ex excellent opportunity as well as the experience um, throughout this whole process has been amazing. Um, so I'm really excited for that and I, I think the judges will really like Runway Crush and what we can provide um, to designers as well as shoppers and the whole experience um, providing that fashion hub for everyone to enjoy. Julie and I'm the founder of Runway Crush. Runway Crush is a new platform that enables independent fashion designers to showcase and sell their designs. 
Currently, the fashion industry is worth over $40 billion. With the explosion of the fashion industry online, it is the perfect opportunity for designers to have their very own platform. Majority of the e-commerce marketplaces available are very craft and handmade oriented, but that doesn't necessarily benefit fashion designers. So we've created a fashion hub specifically for designers to showcase and sell their designs. Consumers want quality, unique pieces, but they are not readily available at the mall or big box stores. So we've created this fashion hub where fashion savvy shoppers can come and view all their emerging designers, their collections, news, trends. Our current revenue comes from commission from each sale, as well as add-on features for designers, and lastly, from advertisers. We are looking for funding today to help with a technical updates for the website for a better experience for designers, shoppers, as well as expanding into the US, and lastly, for PR and marketing to become that global leading designer marketplace. So I think there's two really important things that any fashion website needs to keep in mind. One is curation, because I think that that is something that consumers want from a fashion site. And the other is price. People always want deals. So are you guys curating, and if so, how? And how are you competing on the price side? Uh, right now, when we first came out, um, we had a variety of price ranges, but now we're targeting um, the lower price range as well. So for, that, for those college, university students that want to be able to find those really affordable fashions, but we're also um, looking for to compete against the, you know, the, the 25, 35 and up um, to have those kind of corporate um, office wear as well as dresses and things like that where, where you want to be one of a kind. You want to have that exclusive piece that you're not at the party and everyone else is wearing that same type of dress. So we're, ca we're catering and as we grow, we're going to have a large variety of price ranges for everyone and different styles as well. So we're going to be, not only you can search by dresses, but you can search by different trends. So um, you know, dresses for the office, um, for school, for the festivals coming out in summer, that's really popular amongst a lot of the, the teens and the early 20s as well. So who's your customer? Um, our customer is mainly, not necessarily just an age range, but I mean, if it's an age range, it's kind of the, from the 22 and up, um, 22 to 40-year-old to women um, that are um, you know, looking, for, again, for trendy, um, exclusive pieces, but um, again, we're talking with a lot more of the corporate women, the 25 and up, who can afford that, those nice pieces. Um, but as we move forward, we're adding a lot more for the, for the college and university and high school students. How do you decide what designer you want to promote? Um, well, what we do is we have a process right now where they apply, and as long as they're their own designs, um, then they can be on the site. So we're, we're kind of letting it opening up for all emerging designers to have that outlet to showcase as a sole platform or an additional outlet. So you have your own website, but you want more exposure. So we're helping them get more exposure. But and do you actually say no to them? Um, we haven't said no to anyone yet, no. We, we just kind of have the guidelines. It has to be your own designs. And as long as we just approve the pictures to as long as they're, they're um, you know, good pictures and everything's appropriate, then we would approve them. Is there any focus on size? Because there are some people who are embarrassed or are frustrated when they're going into stores looking for things for themselves because they're not the uh, trim and slim. Mm -hmm. Is size a focus? Um, actually, yeah, that's actually a good point because what we're doing is we're going to start promoting um, more than one size on the views. So when you're looking at a certain dress or top, we want to have not only a size 2 or 3 that you're seeing the standard of, but we want to have a size 12 or 14 so you can really see it how it looks on different body types. And that's something that we're really working towards as well as we start growing. So why would somebody shop on um, Runway Crush instead of, say, Etsy or Bricka or one of the other mm -hmm. sites that already has an audience and a following looking for their, for their type of product? Um, well, the reason being is, again, because a lot of Etsy, like, they have clothing on it as well, which is great. I know Etsy's an amazing site, but they have a lot of, you know, the craft, and a lot of people are, go are going on there, not necessarily looking for clothes. A lot of people, as we're doing market research, you know, they're going on there for other items. So we wanted that fashion hub. So you're not only just looking for emerging designs in their collections, but you're, we're going to have news. We're going to have different trends, different uh, favorite bloggers each week. Just really having that hub so you're coming on there for all those things compared to just shopping. So when you see the latest, this week it's leather trend, you're going to see everything, everyone, what they're saying about leather trend and the designers on our site that have leather items and where you can, you can buy them right on there. Do you have sales now? Um, we have a small amount of sales because when we launched um, for a small? we have $1,000 worth of sales. Um, Over we've, what period? Uh, well, we launched, that was in the first um, three months and I ran out of funding at that point, so I had to stop and that was when we only had a small amount of designers. We started off with just 25, we were already in Flair mm -hmm. um, as one of the top 10 places to shop in Canada, which is amazing. And then now we're growing the amount of designers um, and we have tons of designers, in, sorry, tons of interest from designers in the U.S. as well. So I want to expand into the U.S. and really have that U.S. market as well, so we have that larger market for designers, but as well as for shoppers. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
So you would know more about this, though. What can enhance in the web, like what would well, some of the things you would do? You, you do need functionality in e-commerce. You need to have lots of different ways to browse and access the database. But I was a little surprised you said they ran out of money because a model shouldn't need a lot of overhead. Hi, I'm Anthony Zambri. I'm here to represent Zcon Property Services. We're here today to uh, compete for the Humber Launchpad competition. I'm nervous, I'm calm, I'm eager, I'm energetic, a um, bunch of things. Um, soon enough I'll be representing myself in front of the judges and hopefully win a share of $40,000. Hi, I'm Anthony Zambri, owner of Zcon Property Services. We've been in business for five plus years. We do landscaping in the summer months and we do winter uh, snow removal and ice management in the winter. Uh, with the help of the Humber Launchpad competition, we would like to add a new service called Hydroseeding. What is Hydroseeding? Hydroseeding is an alternative to rolled sod where we can create and also repair our already uh, existing turf. It's made up of four elements, seed, fertilizer, mulch, and water. What are the advantages? The advantages are simple. Um, we can be greener, stronger. Our root system can fight off disease and drought. We can retain up to 10 times as much water. And also, the best part, the price. A contemporary sod uh, layer will charge anywhere from $1.50 to $2.50 per square foot. A hydro seed will charge $0.12 cents to $0.20 cents per square foot. We can yield large profits. So questions? So what differentiates uh, you from your competitors that are currently doing hydro seeding? Well, currently right now, we don't have many competitors. And what we want to do is be on the residential and commercial uh, market. And right now, there's only competition in the industrial and municipal areas. Um, these kinds of heavy hitters only do these projects because they yield a lot of profit. Um, their price or is a little bit cheaper, but the acreage is a lot higher. So what we can also offer as a company is that we, since we have an existing landscape company, say we have uh, we do a job for hydro seeding, now we can also acquire that customer to do for maintenance. So now we're also providing better um, uh, comp we can buy, provide better profit for both sides of the company. How much does it cost to get into this business? Um, you can start anywhere um, at 20000 uh, 20, uh, You can work your way up to 100000 It all depends on what kind of market you're going to be attracting. So for me, I want to do residential and commercial, like I said. So we can start off with a $20,000 machine, and we can go on from there. So you have a, a great product, obviously, from the looks of it. Mm -hmm. I think your biggest challenge is going to be marketing. Okay, so you can go to any hardware store, any Home Depot, buy sod, buy, you know, seed, all kinds of different ways that you can, you know, add grass mm -hmm. or bolster the grass that's currently on your lawn. So how are you going to let the public know that this exists, that you're cheaper, and that, as you say, you're better? That's a, that's a great question. The number one thing that Zcon is going to be doing is creating awareness. Awareness is something um, we're, we're going to try implementing right away is because a lot of people don't know what hydro seeding is. Now, the way that we're going to be doing this and the way that Zcon hopefully uh, enters in the market is that we want to be on HGTV, we want to start doing graphics television, um, maybe do a segment with Mike Holmes. All these things create awareness. This is how people know our business and that we're offering. Another thing that we wanted to offer is a lot of uh, street marketing. Now, uh, and things in my experience is that I've gone through Union Station, uh, it's just an example, I've gone through Union Station, and OLG, for example, will advertise oh, jackpot, jackpot, jackpot. What we wanted to do a skit. Uh, this is this is an example of a skit of what hydro seeding is, and that Zcon is in service to our, our, our customers, and this will create awareness, and this will also attract new customers. In the first couple of years, we're going to have a, a marketing program where we have a, like a strong referral program. So this will also um, get us new customers. Now, is this uh, this is seasonal? This is seasonal. This is correct. But um, when we start getting into the heavier machinery. Um, we'll have to buy trucks. Now, since Zcon is already in the snow removal industry, that truck will also produce income all year round because it'll be then used for salting. What's the compound on the blue? It doesn't look environmentally friendly, is it, it? It is very environmentally friendly. What's it made of? It's seed, fertilizer, mulch, and water. So it creates the blue color. Why is it? Um, it it's mostly the mulch that creates the blue color. Um, different seeds, different mixes, um, creates different colors. That's the beauty of this trade. Um, Different sites require different blends. So if you have one site that's all uh, sun, then you would use a more, more of a sun mix, right? But if you're doing a lot of erosion control, which is like a lot of the bigger hitters, bigger companies use, um, they do more of like a wildflower, which cre or controls erosion. Is there any, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, 
Have you done this before? I've done it. I've done it a couple times. I worked for a company that did hydro seeding, so I am very familiar with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, ladies first. I was trying to jump in. No, no, ladies first, please. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's the only way you're going to get a question. I know. Because yeah. I realized after the first one, I'm like, ah, what? <laughs> I believe, believe, believe. Yeah. yeah. It's like, okay. Uh, I used to do off the record, so that's what oh, I was like. Go, you yeah. literally have to boom, boom, boom. See, I'm an editor, not a reporter, so I'm not the one shouting my questions. <laughs> you can talk, though. I think I did pretty well. Uh, I was a little bit nervous, but uh, anything of this proportion can make somebody very nervous. Um, I wish I could have said a little bit more about how much income we, the, uh, prop, the, our company would have made, but that's okay. Uh, hope everybody does well and everybody has a good time doing this. My name is Colin. I'm a professional musician and currently the Vice President of Student Life here at Humber College. This new venture I'm focusing on is a workshop, a motivational workshop for high school students. I've been helping students make that transition from secondary school to post-secondary school. The thing that kind of sets it apart is we use music as a medium to deliver that message. Uh, using my experience with performance and student leadership to motivate students to follow their own path. My main focus has always been music. Why did I start doing this in the first place, right? Why did I start music because we all know like you're going into you're going to school for you can go to school for anything really so you have a choice something that most people say doesn't have any job security blah 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 but the reality is like how badly do you want to do it like why do you want to do it hi Colin response is my business we provide motivational uh, workshops for high school students except we use music as a medium to deliver that message now the reason why we're doing this is because guidance departments in high schools are desperate for it right now. In the past year, in Ontario funded colleges, this, the ratio for guidance counselors to students was 371 students per one guidance counselor. Now they don't have the funding for more full-time staff, but they're still looking for creative ways that are cost-effective to engage students. So that's where my business comes in. So we offer a workshop named Expect Everything, and it focuses on three specific pillars optimizing optimism, effective time management, and establishing definable goals. Now the funding I'm actually looking for is $10,000 for the technical equipment needed to run the workshop. So that's, I'm talking about microphones, lab mics, wireless mics, loudspeakers, amplification, lighting, etc. So what do you charge for a gig and what at the end of it does the school get for its money? Okay, so the service is $1,200, right? So the thing that we're focusing on in here, um, obviously establishing goals, time management, optimizing optimism, uh, the schools have the benefit now of having uh, their students having access to further guidance that they otherwise do not have. And they otherwise do not have the funding to actually get it when it comes to full-time staff and guidance counselors. There's a ton of funding that's out there um, for, I guess, arts related um, activities at schools, but it's not necessarily tapped into. So that's, that's where I'm trying to, uh, that's the direction I'm trying to move. Are you getting paid now? Um, to do them? Yeah. No, but my background is um, in student life and as a professional musician. So um, I'm fusing those two things together into this workshop. And I did a pilot of it um, this past summer and it was very well, rec well received. Okay, so give me an example exactly how this would work with you going into the school. And the reason why I'm asking about mm -hmm. this is because, as you know, uh, when it comes to funding for music programs, they've been cut back uh, a heck of a lot in the last couple of years. Absolutely, yeah. And I'm not sure, like, do schools really want this and need this? So put this all together for okay. me. Okay, so funding has been cut for music without a doubt. And that's why I'm headed into the actual guidance sector of things because that's where they're looking for um, more engaging things for students. So simply using music as a medium to access all students. It's not actually um, targeted towards music students, right? Simply using music as a medium to deliver the message because it's something that all types of students are engaged with. And what's the most important when you're engaging with students is having something that's gonna catch their attention and actually have them buy into the information you're trying to let them know. So but what kind of, Sorry, no, I was no, just gonna sorry. say, to building on your point, mm -hmm. how are they gonna pay for it? If they don't have the money for, for like the money's 
coming out of the system rapidly. Yes. So how are they going to find the twelve hundred dollars to pay? Well, for it? but there is there is funding for guidance. There isn't funding for music related programs. And there's a lot of um, organizations that work with at risk youth. There's a lot of private schools. There's a lot of even though it's not specifically music related, there's a lot of music schools that have funding for those specific types of things. So I don't want you guys to think that it's that it's moving in the musical direction. It's simply using music as a medium to help deliver the message of guidance for students um, for furthering their careers and transitioning from secondary school to post-secondary education. Okay, like I love the idea about the you know motivation and everything else, but when it comes to music, that's such an individual thing. So what type of music are you using mm -hmm. to bring everybody together for this? So actually, it's my music. So I've been a professional musician for the past five years. I performed for Canada's Walk of Fame two consecutive years. I just returned from France playing a festival up there. Um, so it's actually going to be my music and a group of fellow musicians coming in, um, kind of sending that message to students that, listen, you can follow a career path that people say may not be realistic as long as you are thinking critically about what you're doing and following your passion. Using myself as an example, asking them thought-provoking questions about the things that they may be interested in pursuing. Are you involved in the follow-up as well? You said there's lots of guidance afterwards. Are you part of that afterward guidance, or is your gig once to attract attention and then hand it over to guidance counselors? Um, I guess it's, it's kind of both the workshop. Um, we deal with them when it comes to guidance, and then we're gone. Uh, but we're going to be accessing several different schools, mm -hmm. opposed to just uh, staying in one particular place. Um, it's just a one-day service. We'll say 72 minutes, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. So the judges asked me questions that I didn't expect them to ask. I thought they would be asking more business-related questions, but they were more so interested in the workshop itself. I mean, when it comes to how comfortable I was, I felt like I was comfortable, but I'm not sure if they asked enough questions about the business to really have them warned investing the money in it. So I'm less uh, concerned about whether my business was worth the money or whether they got the information that they could have if they asked certain questions. So in that sense, a little weary about it, but in terms of how I did and how I answered the questions, I think I did a, a really good job. My name is Li. Uh, right now I'm a first year student in multimedia design program. And my name is Jen. Uh, I'm a programmer uh, work, uh, working uh, for the EasyTruck.net. Our, uh, our uh, pitching is like we actually provided the mobile printer, uh, printer technology to students, which allows the students that to print their document about the, by the smartphone directly instead of that using a computing lab. My best and favorite subject is um, interface design because I think um, first it's very magic because I, when I code in the uh, web, like I use CSS and JavaScript, I can create uh, the best user's uh, experience. So I can interact with the users, but I don't need to talk with them. I will give them the happy experience when they use their apps. Yes, uh, our project is Mobile Printer, which is the software solution they provide to the IT department of the College of University, like as a service to provide uh, the bridge between the, the IT uh, printer system to student smartphone. Then, by using our solution, we help to solve the two problems. One is that we actually help students to easy print on campus by using all the way they usually go to the lab, find a valuable computer, and the login to systems and document to print that back back. It's just a user takes like more than f uh, 15 minutes to have it done. By using our technology, we can have it done in one minute. Also, it's valuable for IT department as well because we actually help IT department to move part of the uh, job from, from their computer to student smartphone, which we just increase the capacity for, exi for their existing system. So we actually help them to save the budget for uh, investment into the purchase a new computer or upgrading the lab. So that's why our solution can both benefit like college, uh, uh, IT department in college or university, also the students. So printing is on the decline. 
generally, right? Like most people, the whole point of the cloud is that you generally don't need to print documents much anymore. So do you see that as being an issue in terms of your growth and sustainability? Uh, yes, I know that most of the time we just go to the electronic hard, uh, hard copy, maybe for both of you, but we still, so most of the time the students still need to some printer to, to hard, code, uh, hard copy to the professor. That's why that we, when we go through the, the campus, we always to see people, students line up for printer. So that's where I think we still have the chance, but printer will never be limited because people still prefer to read the paper. Right, even we have e-link, but it doesn't matter. Who, who pays for this and how much? Yeah, actually, we will rent it, it, it as a service to IT department. Uh, based on, on our research, like in North America, we have more than 4,500 uh, post-secondary uh, uh, colleges, university. Uh, so that's which means that we have large market. Our uh, market price is we, no, we have two. When we provide a very low cost as a service avenue fee to this IT department, maybe just a f uh, five thousand or ten thousand a year. But uh, actually, that they can improve the, 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 the their system to more efficient way. And uh, uh, another part is we can actually that's just a pretty free, free, uh, free service to, to the college. They don't have the budget for the IT IT project, so we can put some advertise, ad, uh, advertisement platform on the app. The students using. They actually, we get a free user and a charged user. For the charged user, we don't, we don't need too much, uh, accept too much. Uh, like for example, if we charge uh, like uh, 5,000 per for a university or college, but even we have just a 5% of the market share, it's still like more than 250 the college or schools that we can have. But uh, annually, it still, still costs uh, like the 1 million uh, revenue on our budget. Uh, our avenue uh, as our avenue income, but mm -hmm. by the number of the of the customer increasing uh, year by year, we actually can make the business just uh, like a running a snowball and make it a bigger. bigger. Thank, you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now. Isn't there built-in obsolescence though? Once oh, yeah. all the printers oh, are saying. wireless. Like, but at even if like point, people like people like will still be. Professors, you know, uh, get more recognize yeah. that the yeah. need to print stuff out isn't necessary anymore because they are getting used to reading yeah. stuff online yeah. and making notes online. That's or what I was, if I was going to throw in one question, I was going to say to him, I disagree with you when you said we're always going to need printers. Yeah. No, no, we no, are no. not. I, I use a printer once a month, maybe, to I, print a few sheets I out. I do That's print stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I do. I, I print stuff. But, and I think some people you, in a university environment, I understand, because you probably have to hand in documents and but to me, as soon as the printers are wireless, there's no app, mm -hmm. there's no functionality. Okay. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lindsay. And I'm Brennan. And we're from Train Me Fit. So our business idea is to have small group training and personal training and we want to uh, collaborate with other healthcare professionals to create a team around individuals who otherwise uh, may not be working out. How are you feeling? Uh, somewhat nervous, but not like too crazy nervous. Just a good amount of nervousness, I guess. <laughs> it's been a long time coming. It's been three months, so it's the most nerve-wracking part is that you only have a minute to try to say yeah. everything about your business. Um, but I think at this point, it'll be good to um, I don't know get to relax a little bit and yeah. uh, not have this on our plate anymore. It's been a lot of fun, though. Yeah. Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Brennan, and we're Train Me Fit. Train Me Fit offers small group training in Brampton and in-home personal training in Brampton, Mississauga, and Toronto. In 2012, it was reported that overweight and obese Canadians did not receive weight management advice from their doctors, despite the fact that they're at risk for diseases such as type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So our mission is to create partnerships with healthcare practitioners so that we can create a team around these individuals to increase adherency to lifestyle changes. We have done so with two chiropractors already, which has done well to generate business, and a medical doctor has just asked for our presence in her office. Train Me Fit trainers have their formal education as well as research-based certifications to better help us push our clients through the stages of change. We have just hired two trainers, one for Toronto and one for Mississauga, and we will continue to expand our business in this way. We are asking you for $15,000 to support our marketing and our marketing needs, our promotional needs, so that we can get the certifications that we need and our growing administrative needs. With your help, Train Me Fit can help empower Canadians, and we can provide them with the services that could save their lives. Thank you. 
When you talk about in-home training, whose home are we talking about? The trainer's home or the customer's home? The client's home. It's the, so you go to the we client's home? We would go home. to their home, yes. And so you guys are training other people to go into people's homes to help them get fit. That's correct. Do you know of any other competitors who are doing anything like this? Yeah, there, there are, are competitors in the area that do the same thing. Um, the difference in the way that we're running it is that they generally pay their trainers about $25 for the session, even though they're charging 100 um, and their clients' homes that they're going into are generally people who are active anyway and are just looking for someone to help keep them going. We're giving our, our trainers 50% of the profit so that we have their help in pushing health promotion into the community into addition to actually training those clients. And we're going after people who have been sedentary in recent history. What's the certification you're referring to? Uh, CSEP certification, as well as uh, some post-secondary in a fitness-related field. And will all of your trainers have the same certification? Yes. yes, or an equivalent to the CSEP, which is the Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology. Just curious, how are you finding these trainers? Because my thinking is, if I'm a trainer, why am I going to you, giving you my cut, yeah. where I can go do it myself? So the trainers that we just hired are also Humber grads. The reason that they're coming and working through us is that we've done everything. We have the marketing plan together. We have the resources for them, the website, the social media. We're doing the networking. We're breaking into the neighborhoods with them. All they have to do is show up and train. So they're using our resources, and they're getting a bigger cut than they would if they went to a box gym or to another in-home training service by doing that through us. But it just makes their job a little bit easier. And curious, how long are, like, I don't know what the contract is between you and the trainers, but how many years is it that they're going to be with you in case they decide, hey, I want to go on my own, now that I've got the information from you guys. Yeah, so we have the independent contractor signed with us. We don't have a set term. We just have the, you know, please give us three months, or sorry, 30 days notice if you're going to leave, and there is a clause in there that says you can't take our clients. Unfortunately, that is a risk of the business, that if you hire in-home clients or you have trainers that are working at your gym, they might just take everything that they can from you. And, and leave and do it on their own. I mean, we're aware of that. The trainers that we have hired are Humber grads and they're very excited about the way that we're going about this, trying to make healthcare more preventative. Um, so we're confident that they're gonna stick with us. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. Yeah. I would have asked you because you'd have to spend a lot of money on insurance. Yeah. I would spend the $15,000 buying a great insurance policy. Uh, it went really well, I think. Um, it was a lot less, they were a lot less intimidating than I thought they were going to be. Uh, once we got in there, they were actually smiling, which kind of threw me, <laughs> threw me off. But Yeah, I think we got to say everything that we needed to say and the practice pitches that we had done before this prepared us well for the questions that we would be asked today. So I felt like we had a good answer for all of them. I just wish there was a bit more time because yeah. we get cut off at the end. But it was good and it feels good to be done. Definitely. Yeah. My name is Craig Pettin, co-founder of AquaGreens. And I'm Pablo Alvarez, I'm co-founder of AquaGreens as well. AquaGreens is an aquaponics company that uh, deals with creating and selling produce. Aquaponics, by the way, is a hybrid farming technology that uses hydroponics and aquaculture. We really want to target the uh, supermarkets and grocery uh, chains. We're actually better than organic because of the hyper locality of our food. We don't have to be traveling from 4,300 miles away. Anything food related, anything we can uh, get a whole lot, just stay, stay on top of things and just get everyone's perspective, even not even Toronto, like what they're doing in, in the States or doing anywhere else in the world. I think it's, it's important that we keep up with that. And, and we love it. I mean, I just, like I said, I'm just, uh, you know, it's, it's really cool. How many people have purchased this organic lettuce from the grocery store? We all know this organic lettuce is better for us, containing less pesticides, herbicides, and, and fungicides. But did you know this organic lettuce has come from California or Mexico, and it travels at least 4,500 kilometers away? <laughs> uh, but we have a solution to this problem. My name is Pablo Alvarez. My name is Craig Pettin. And uh, we own a company called AquaGreens. So we use an aquaponics technology, which is a combination of hydroponics and aquaculture to produce the most nutrient-rich, locally grown, organic leafy greens and fish. It's a closed-loop ecosystem that doesn't allow the use of chemicals at all. 
our produce is four times more nutrient rich and uses 98% less water than traditional soy based agriculture. As a result of our temperate climate, we're going to be located in a vertically, vertically stacked 3,000 square foot indoor environment so we can offer local grocers our produce year round. Food, Food to, to the, the city, city from, from the, the city. city. Because you're doing that here, I assume in Toronto, yes. Yes. what's the price compared to this than to the other product going to be? Same, if not less. Yes. Organic, coming from California or Mexico, uh, has a transportation fee of about 30% because they have to have a cold chain all the way from harvest to the store. There's obvious cost in keeping that cold temperature. Uh, obviously, the transportation too. We're able, even being indoors, lighting it artificially, um, we're able to match the cost. Yeah. What about lifespan? Lifespan, longer, longer. Yeah. Uh, nutrients. Uh, nutrients. So aquaponics uh, actually has a quicker growth cycle than traditional soil-based culture. It, uh, where it would take 58 days for lettuce to grow in the ground, it's 26 days in hydroponics. In aquaponics, my apologies. It's a hydroponics technology with addition of the fish. And think because it's a closed loop ecosystem approach of growing food, it actually, it's constantly getting nutrients because it's submerged in the water. So not only are we growing faster, but there's more nutrients and tastes better than any of, the, any of your competitors' products. So. Are you in production now? Not no. yet. Okay, so if we gave you $40,000, what would you do with it? Open our doors within the next two months. We have pending contracts with uh, grocery chain, restaurant chains, and uh, farmers markets. Have you taken any um, education from, I know this is a very hot area, especially in the states right now, right. have you, uh, particularly in Colorado, have you gone down and, and talked to people like this to say what they're doing right you could do up here? Right. Quite a few times. So this is like a, 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 um, a facility called Farm Here in Chicago. We actually visited this site uh, back in June, I believe, and these folks started with uh, three, three or 4,000 square feet, and within three years, they went to 90,000 square feet. So that was the demand. There's, they're now supplying 70 uh, stores in the Chicago area, as well as teaming up with Whole Foods. So as much as Craig, Craig and I want to be here right now, we have to make sure that our system, that we're confident moving forward and we can prove to Toronto we can grow this here. Not so only visiting that, we have gone to master class, master class classes in aquaponics and aquaculture. We're close with the Ministry of Agriculture, and we also have people on in the city that really want to build up urban, urban agriculture and are helping us with our zoning, are helping us where we can find um, a better fit for the stores and they're championing us. And we've got uh, our mentors and advisors are uh, pioneers of the field of aquaponics who have been in the field for 30 plus years. We're actually teaming up with uh, the guys in Detroit, which is the closest aquaponics to Toronto. And uh, they've just uh, helped uh, help They've uh, actually uh, agreed to help our uh, designer system here in Toronto. So, thank you very okay, much. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Hi, we just finished uh, pitching our idea to the judges. Uh, just, uh, we're just so ecstatic the opportunity for us to actually pitch in front of them, the experts, and uh, great experience. Great experience. It just went by so fast. Yeah. Not because we feel that we didn't get our answers in concisely. It was just. We could talk about this for hours. Yeah, and even, even us leaving, uh, you guys just kept asking us questions, so hopefully that's a good in indication that we uh, did well. Um, so yeah, great, great, yeah. great experience. Good, we can eat now. Yeah, 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 we're hungry. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name's Jeremy. Hey, my name's Mike, and we're here with Romancer. It's an online dating concierge we started what, like uh, almost a year, a few months yeah. ago, something oh, like that? A little May. while ago. Okay, um, basically <laughs> what we do is we help couples connect uh, romantically by coming up with fun and exciting dates and taking a lot of the work out of those like romantic evenings. All the planning, all the booking the reservations, the gambling on a new place, we remove all of that and make it really easy for everyone. And my favorite part about that is we also do the nanny service. We're, we're gonna have it so that you guys can come to our website and book a nanny right on spot, which I'm so excited for. Yeah, and we're a little nervous about today, not going to lie, but it's also been really, really fun. Yeah, uh, we met a lot of great people during this competition, and I'm really excited to see which one of us comes out, out on top, and I'm nervous to see if I'm on top. I want to be on top. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michael Paus. This is my partner, Jeremy Haber. We're here with Romancer. So picture this. Uh, tonight's the big night. It's Saturday, and that means date night. Where are you and your partner going to go tonight? 
Are you going to go on the same old boring date, or are you going to go somewhere new and, and exciting? How do you find somewhere new and exciting to go? Do you gamble on a friend's recommendation, or do you research somewhere online? How long will that take you? It could literally take you hours to do all of that and book your reservations. But not with our website, we'll answer. Uh, what our website allows you to do is we basically make putting together a romantic night a breeze. Um, we help you find the perfect venue for your perfect nights, whatever your budget, wherever you are in the city, and we do it all of it for free, including book your reservations. We showcase the best businesses in the city of Toronto, and we charge them appropriately for the number of reservations that we send them. That's how we make our revenue. Right now, though, we're looking for a capital injection to help us do demographic research and marketing. Uh, it's important we do this quickly, though, as we're the only company here in Canada offering this service, and we really, really want to get the word out. So, I, I like the model. It sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. but I wonder whether you have the revenue model a little bit backwards. My concern would be if the businesses are paying for this, and you're trying to showcase the best businesses, you're actually only showing the businesses that are willing to pay you money. So you're not mm -hmm. necessarily showing the customer the best businesses. And do you guys not think you would be better off charging the customers, and then you do the curation by actually showing all the best businesses because well, you've actually done that research? Uh, we, we thought about that, um, but we fe felt it was better because it is performance-based. We're able to track exactly the number of uh, reservations we send to a business because we have a partnership with OpenTable, that it's completely win-win. There's no harm in a business being on our website. Uh, we also do a lot of like feedback sharing, so we encourage our users to write comments and reviews, and we share that with the businesses as well. So we let them know what their customers are saying. And are those, are those, sorry, are those ratings um, transparent to the user as well? Yes. yes. Okay. So as an individual, okay, so here I am, I want to go out on a date. 49 years old, want to take my girl out, she's about, we'll say, 48. <laughs> I want to go out, um, I've only got maybe, say, 200 bucks to spend that night, all right? But I want to go out to dinner, may want to go out dancing, how are you going to help me? Well, we actually have a really good search bar where you can search the area of the city that you want to be in as well as your budget and what you're looking to do. So if you're looking for a place that dance, like a date that involves dancing, yeah. you can find one for your budget as well as, like, we don't just send you to a single place. We tend to tell you venues to go afterwards as well. So we'll tell you the best place to go dancing, somewhere good with live music, and then somewhere you can walk to, like a nice romantic walk that ends with like a bar that has a good place for drinks. Now I'm curious though, where are you getting the research for that? Because let's face it, when it comes to romancing ladies, all right, <laughs> they're all different. <laughs> so you may be telling me one thing, I may find out at the end of the night I'm going home alone. So <laughs> um, a lot of psychiatric, like psych psychological research went into a lot of these dates. Um, we tend to use at least two to three venues at a time. Uh, I actually used to work for Bytopia as an account manager. So for six months or so, my job was to find the best restaurants and venues in the city for couples. Uh, that's what I did. So I've been doing this for a while. I know a lot of the owners of these venues already. I've met with them and talked to them about our website. Um, so yeah, we try and just highlight the best spots in the city. So how, how do you define your target person? Who's looking at your website? Uh, essentially, anyone who's dating. If you're actively dating, we're trying to appeal to a lot of people. In fact, at the moment, we're looking to do a little bit more demographic research mm -hmm. to see if there's like a wider market. Uh, if maybe the 49-year-olds taking their girlfriends out are a little bit better. Uh, boys. We do obviously know our <laughs> demographic a little bit better, so a lot of the dates are written around younger daters. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not too much trouble to expand. Like we are, you are able to search for what you're looking for, whether you want like an anniversary type date or a first date coffee date. That's easy to find. I get the impression you're talking more to men than you are to women. <laughs> because with women, you, you want to be romanced. Yeah, yeah. It, typically it's the, it's the guy's job to put together that romantic date and impress her. But with that said, there's nothing stopping a woman from going on her website, finding a really good date, and being like, just take me on this. What's your pricing model? Have you thought about what you're going to charge the restaurants? Uh, it depends on the restaurant. Um, uh, it's something we do with Bytopia, we, we find out the average price per head and then charge them appropriately. And we want to do the same thing. Like, I don't want to charge a cafe where people are going to spend about $15, the same that I would spend, say, George on Queen, where the average high price per head is $100. Thanks. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, my name's Tim. Uh, my company's called Soundstill Production, and we make live performance music videos. I'm pretty pumped to be here today, uh, a little bit nervous. I always get a little bit anxious in front of the film, or in front of the cameras, rather. I'm used to being on the other side. Uh, like I said, we make live performance music videos, so do a, a multi-tap track off the front of house system, so we guarantee 
the best sounding and looking videos that bands are able to get these days. I'm here to pitch uh, a live crowdfunded concert series that we're using as a way for bands to get our services without having to pay out of pocket. Hi, my name is Tim O'Reilly. My company is called Soundstill Production, and we produce live performance music videos. Um, so video has become the new standard in music consumption and discovery, you know, with YouTube, smartphones, tablets. So bands looking to gain traction and advance their own careers need our services in order to, to do so. Um, we're one of the front runners in the Toronto scene. We've just been in business for over a year. We've done about $10,000 worth of sales so far, and things are picking up in a hurry. Uh, we've done funk, folk, classical. We're working on a series, uh, five parts for a bunch of Toronto Symphony guys right now, in fact. So what I'm here to talk to you about mainly is a new venture that we're working on putting together, and it's a live crowdfunded video concert series. So a lot of bands are on shoestring budgets, so they can't afford elaborate production. So we're putting on a show at Toronto's Great Hall on April 24th. We have four incredibly talented bands. We're going to fill the room full of people. We're going to vi video capture the whole event, um, and we're going to you know, put our production through the roof. And the whole event is going to be funded by the people coming in the door with ticket sales. And that way, we have an opportunity to give our product to them for free, and also amass a huge amount of content in one fell swoop. Okay, um, I know the style that you're doing it with the, the, the way you're doing this content. I mean, Chaos did that a couple of years ago during his tour. Basically, if you like what you, you're hearing, pay. How are you going to advertise this to get people to come out for this because you need money to do it in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have a huge marketing campaign going right now. We're postering all over the place. Uh, we have a strong support base in the Humber School of Music. Um, as a starting point. If we can get 200 people in the door, then we've already broken even on this event. Um, and right now we're just trying to establish the model as viable. But we're reaching out to social networks, so Reddit, Eventbrite. Um, we've got contacts at the CBC that we're trying to um, promote to, and we're hoping that we can get radio spots on CBC Radio 3, and basically anyone who's interested in independent music in the country, because if the model proves viable, we could do a series, you know, coast to coast, and profile independent scenes across the country. And I think that's your issue, right? Is because if, you go, if you're going to start going across the country, you need money to fund the travel and all the other things that go along with it. Absolutely. So what kind of cut are you taking at the door? What's in it for the bands? I mean, they get a video, which is great. They can put something up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But what kind of money are the bands making outside of that? And how can this model possibly scale to the point where you actually will be able to fund the operation to throw these concerts, which you're going to have to throw a lot of, yeah. all across the country and, and hopefully in other parts of the world as well? So the, uh, the bands are compensated with the video. And that it's a loss leader on their part. Um, because video is a must-have for anyone trying to book festival opportunities. I'm a working musician myself, and you know, whenever I'm applying to festivals or big money gigs, they won't even consider you if you don't have live performance footage. Um, so it's something that they absolutely need. And for them to hire us, it's about $700 value to get two tunes produced. So for them to be getting this service for just the cost of their time is a great deal on their part. As far as scaling it goes, um, I think the event needs at this point just to cover the cost of the production and the real future is in the media that we're creating. With four bands doing three five minute videos per group, we have an opportunity to make an hour's worth of content for each of these stops. We've already gotten some interest from Ox TV, Concert TV, there are a whole bunch of networks that are interested in distributing independent content but they have no access to it and they're dealing with um, you know, unions and for them to, to get in there and to capture it at this high level of production, uh, it's, it's just a cost that they're not willing to undertake at this point. But if the media is ready there for them. Um, so we'll have individual tracks which will go up online on YouTube and be available to the bands. But then we'll have added content that we'll stitch together into an hour long program and then launch a 24 part series documenting you know, so why, why aren't you, as if I'm a, a band, why, why aren't you directly marketing and de uh, developing their EPKs? Uh, the, the bands themselves? Yeah, the bands themselves. It seems like having a concert, you're kind of hopeful of that, as opposed mm -hmm. to working with the bands directly. And saying, well, we, we do work with bands directly, and we do marketing. So what, like, if I'm a band and up and coming, like, what, what's it cost me to get a video out there? Uh, six to seven hundred dollars, depending on the production value you want. We do, uh, you know, run and gun style. 
So we've done these for a bunch of Toronto artists, um, and we'll set up in a furniture store or a bar or somewhere really quirky. Uh, we'll mic them up, and um, yeah, we, we do all the multi-track recording live, multi-angle video capture, um, and yeah, it's it's been a huge success. So we're going to continue on with that part of our business. Great, thank you. Thank you. Because I'd like to see where they would go with it. What were the asks for for the other for all four of those companies? Only one company said that. The thing with ZedCon too is I'm not sure they need the money. If it's such a low cost uh, yeah. operation, I'm not yeah. quite sure what. I, it's, that's what it sounds like. Setting wheels. Well, he didn't say anything. Yeah. Track? No, no. He said they have trucks for Winters, so they would use it. Oh, that's if they if they had a truck. Right. So he could go seasonal. Right. This is yeah. the only idea we saw that has patent potential. Yes. That's why yes. I like it. Yeah. I think they need the most they money, but the they also were my favorite. Of yeah. All of them. yeah. So, so I'd be I willing to give them like thirty thousand dollars, to be honest, no, or even twenty. I, I, yeah. I, I give them twenty. You, this is this is going to be the most expensive operation yes. to get off the ground, but yes. it's also our favorite. So but why would we give them less? The, yeah. Okay. Um, what's that? Sorry. Do we have a verdict? Yeah, I'm okay with all that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Hello, and welcome back to Launchpad. All the contestants did a, a wonderful job impressing the judges as well as myself. Judges, do you have anything to say? So listen guys, you all did a really great job. You know, it's a real pleasure to sit and watch a bunch of young, eager entrepreneurs present. You only had a minute to do it. We only had five minutes to ask questions. It's a real pressure cooker situation. We were looking for innovation. We were looking for the fact that you knew who your end consumer was. You knew a little bit about the market, and you knew something about the competition. The way we approach this is as though we actually had this money in our pockets and we were going to hand it out to you. So that's a bit of a ruthless scenario. You know, business is business, and the decisions that we made were based on whether or not we would actually want to give you that amount of money if it was our money, and that's how we approach this competition. But thanks for having us, and you all did a really great job. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you for your feedback. Thank you. And here are top four grand prize winners. Zcon. Tuscarora. Sound Still Productions. And our finalist and the grand prize winner of twenty thousand dollars, Aqua Green. Thank you guys for watching and 